Thank you for joining another edition of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I'm Brian Ferguson. My guest today is best known for working in the American Wrestling Association, AWA, and the WWF. He has worked with many of the pro wrestling greats of the past and is well known throughout the pro wrestling world. He is also a recently published author of the book titled Professional Wrestling, The Theater of the Absurd, I Never Wanted to Be a Star. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Tom Rocky Stone. Tom, thanks for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. So let's talk about growing up, uh, growing up and how you kind of your schooling and your and how how you got in the wrestling business. Let's let's start out with sure. that if we could. Well, I lived in Milwaukee my whole life up until I started wrestling. Uh, and I first found out about wrestling, it was around 1969. Okay. My dad became the ring announcer for Vern in Milwaukee, Green Bay, and Rockford. And that was my first introduction to wrestling. And I thought it looked neat with the guys flying in and yeah. coming down and wrestling and decided that I wanted to try it. That's interesting. How old were you? Uh... When you just, how old were you when you saw those matches? At I was probably years? a high school freshman. Okay. In fact, one of my my first memory of the matches was the night Hercules Cortez and Red Bastine defeated Mad Dog and Butcher in Milwaukee. Ah. That was kind of the thing that made me want to do it. Yeah. And at that point, Red Bastine was my favorite wrestler. Yeah. yeah. And then I started liking the villains, and I started cheering for Nick and Ray and uh, carried <laughs> signs that said Nick and Ray country in Milwaukee. Oh. Became a heel fan. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was doing the timekeeping for my dad. Okay. And I was no longer a heel fan. And I became <laughs> a timekeeper and got to meet the guys like Lars Anderson. And I became good friends with Nick and Ray. Yeah. And, uh, Decided I wanted to be it, but didn't know how to get into it. Okay. Well, go ahead. So sorry. No, and then when I got into college, a guy was having a spoof on wrestling, and I went and met him. And uh, his name was Ned Wicker, and he knew the local one of the little local promoters okay. in town. And uh, so I'll introduce you. And uh, I was on their show like two weeks later even though I'd never been trained, it was strictly just backyard stuff. Okay. And by the third or fourth show, I was booking it. Oh, wow. I That's pretty amazing. Right and then I took over. And then I met Frank Hill, and he got me my first shot in St. Louis and then in Minneapolis. Okay. So I read, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I read that you started professionally in 1978 as a is that right? It was in around that time. Okay. Probably started earlier in locally. I would probably mm. wrestle locally for a year or two. Okay. What's um, amazing is you're the second person that I've spoken to that had no prior experience either getting trained up at a, some type of uh, academy, Vern's camp or something. The other one was Nikita Koloff. When I asked him, because all over the internet said, oh, he's trained by Eddie Sharkey. No, never, never did anything. So you're the second person, which is pretty I, amazing. I, I actually, after I've been wrestling for all, I did go to Lou Klein's wrestling school in Allen Park, Michigan. Okay. And I lasted there two weeks. In two weeks, I saw him twice. <laughs> and twice, he showed me how to do a headlock. And he was on the road uh, every week with the local. He was like the booking agent for uh, the Sheik. Okay. And after two weeks, I said, well, enough of this. Yeah. And then I met up with Frank Hill and Dick Reynolds in Milwaukee. And I, I started working out with them. Okay. And, uh, yeah. That's just amazing that, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because, you know, you talk about this guy who's gone a lot. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard The Undertaker. He went to see Buzz Sawyer, and you know that was kind of a 
bad deal. Uh, so, but anyways, uh, getting involved in pro wrestling with your dad, and then what would do? You, what was do you remember your first match? What was that like for you? Yeah, my very first match was in St. Louis. I'm wrestling with the Chase. Okay. I wrestled, I wrestled Gary Young and Dan Diamond in the tag team match. Okay. And they beat the piss out of me. <laughs> it was the worst beating I ever took. Oh, wow. I came out of the ring. The ring in, in, at the Chase was harder than the concrete out in the road. It was so freaking hard. Oh, wow. They would walk away when I tried to grab a hold. And they body slammed me and backdropped me probably 20 times. Oh. I, I was never so sore in my life. Yeah. And I got back upstairs to where we were all dressing. And Pat O'Connor said, uh, Stone, you've got uh, Brody on the next tape. I did not know uh, Frank Brody at all. Yeah. And I went up to introduce myself. And his words to me were, well, if I, can't, I want to say thanks now in case I can't say thank you after. At that point, I was ready to get in the car and go home. Because <laughs> uh, this was when, when uh, Bruiser Brody was, before he had gallbladder surgery and lost a lot of weight. Okay. But he was about 320 pounds with a perfect V shape and uh, probably the most menacing guy, looking guy ever. Yeah. And I became good friends with Frank prior to his death. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was a good guy. In fact, he was a lot easier on me than uh, Dan Dung and Gary, or uh, Gary Young and Dan Diamond. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate what happened to uh, Bruiser Brody down in Puerto Rico. You know, it uh, that that's never been, uh, I guess, resolved fully with closure. Well, I think it has. Everyone knows what happened. Well, everybody knows what happened. The guy was never. No, he got away with it. Convicted. Yeah, right. Just like a politician. Yeah, and that's unfortunate. So, and then my first AWA match came a few weeks later. Okay. Uh, it was Herman Schaefer and I against uh, Greg and Vern, the oh. only time they ever teamed up together on TV. Oh wow! Okay. I saw some matches uh, prior to our podcast today. I watched some matches with you. Uh, watched one with uh, Bobby Duncan. And Stan Hansen against you and uh, Steve Olsenowski. Yeah, Steve O. And uh, it was pretty interesting. Uh, you guys yeah, I were. I don't know why Steve O got to pick a different partner to go for the championship. I All right. <laughs> never figured that out. And then I saw you again um, years later in WWF. Uh, wrestling one two three kid sean walton was, that was his first match in there okay and uh and you made him look like a million dollars and uh that's part of your job you know and that's what we were talking about before we come on here today guys like yourself nacho barrera jake milkman milliman you came in there week in week out on these tv tapings and, and made these guys look so good was that hard for you because you know every most wrestlers want to be the guy or close to you know have a championship did that ever well everyone you? wanted to be a star but you yeah. had to start somewhere right and so when i was originally doing jobs for Vern, mm -hmm. uh i knew that was my starting point Mm -hmm. Then I went down and worked in Kansas City for Bob Geigel mm -hmm. and worked full time there for about a half a year. And then I went down and worked for Watts for about nine months. Okay. Well, after working in those two territories, I was a pretty damn good worker. Yeah. You know, I could work with any top guy. Yeah. Uh, so it was easy. When I came back up here, I quit down in Louisiana because Wally Carbo said he could use me over the summer and I was then going to go to Portland in the fall. Okay. And I got home after quitting down in Louisiana, I called Wally and he said, Oh, we're all full. Oh no. And at that point I quit. I stopped wrestling. I put my boots away. Didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. And then it was maybe a year later, Jake called me and said, you want to go to 
I don't remember if it was in mini or we were going to Vegas. It might've been Vegas, but anyways, Jake called me, said, you want to go? I said, sure. Yeah. And then I started working, but by that time I was, I knew everybody. Mm -hmm. They all knew I could work. So my, I, I had no aspirations at that point of going back and wrestling full time. Okay. It was a part-time job, but it was an easy way to make a couple hundred bucks on a Saturday night. Yeah. When 7-Eleven was paying $7 an hour. Uh, yeah. And you still got to go out. If you knew what you were doing, it was still fun. Yeah. Because when I would work with Buck or uh, for Vern, I wrestled Buck a lot. And I wrestled mm -hmm. uh, Brad Riggins. Yeah. And I would lead those matches. Everything that was happening was what I was calling in the ring. Okay. You know, so I was the one controlling the crowd. So I was still getting the fun out of yeah. being, being in control of a thousand people, two thousand people. They were following what I wanted them to do. Yeah. And again, the guys knew I could work, so they would always listen to me. Yeah. And uh, so I knew I was going to do the job, but then it was my job to figure out a way to get the fans afterwards to hate me again, <laughs> which was pretty simple, really, because after the match, I would wait till Buck was on the floor. Yeah. And then I'd spit on him or something. <laughs> He'd come running to get back in the ring, and I'd do the Bobby Heenan jump over the top rope <laughs> and go, fuck you. And uh, hopefully I can use that language. But that's fine. You know, that's and it. the fans hated me. I, I didn't lose. Yeah. They left wanting him to get his hands on me again so we could do it again in three weeks. Yeah. That's but, uh, that's amazing. And then most of the guys like Jake and that I was tr I trained them, and so okay. they were all him and Hangman. Uh, I don't know if you've ever talked to Mike, but no. uh, Texas Hangman. I trained those guys so they all worked the same. They all knew how to work. Yeah. So that's why my guys are so good on TV for those guys because we'd go up and tell them what we could do to get them over. Yeah. That's pretty good, me, because you know, I don't know if this is true or not. My my perspective is that a lot of guys that are in a match, they want to call the match. I it's, don't know. If it's always the heel. Okay. So fact, the first match I had, I was a heel. It was with Baron, and I thought, well, he's an old timer. I'll get let him lead. Well, he thought I knew what I was doing, so he let me lead. So nobody led. So nobody led. <laughs> it was god awful. The worst match I've ever had. Oh. But it, it was the heel. It didn't, I mean. Yeah. The heels were supposed to lead. Okay. Well, that's I didn't know that. See, that's something I learned. I did not know that. So that's pretty amazing. Hey everyone, this is Brian Ferguson. I know if you're watching this that you're enjoying the Bumps and Thumps podcast. In order to continue the podcast and get the guests on that everyone wants to hear about, we need support from listeners like you. There are a few ways you can do this. One is going to anchor.fm, which will be on the bottom of your screen here, and click the uh, support button. There you can make a monthly contribution uh, to support the podcast. There's also, our, we have a Teespring store. We have a link down at the bottom of the screen as well for that. And we have products such as t-shirts, like this one I'm wearing, backpacks, glassware, and other great items for you to purchase. Those purchases go directly back into the podcast and get on guests that require financial compensation. Thank you again for your support. Go to those websites and, and support our podcast, and we will continue to bring the guests that you want to hear about past and present. And thank you for your support and enjoy the podcast. So traveling around, you know, you went to Vegas, you know, Louisiana, Mid-South, Kansas City, Minneapolis. What was that? Is that, was that challenging for your family life? Is it, did you bring them with? Did you leave well, for a I few was, weeks, come back? I was not married when I was in Kansas City or Baton Rouge. Okay. Uh, my girlfriend at the time did come down to both places. Okay. Uh, but not, not really. It was just like having a second shift job. You okay. were home most nights. 
Yeah. And they were basically Louisiana, Kansas City was Kansas City on Thursday. Uh, Saturdays were Des Moines usually. Uh, Mondays were Wichita. And other shows were mixed in. Uh, but you were home most, I mean, Topeka was 60 miles. Wichita was a three hour drive. Des Moines was a two and a half hour drive. But you were home every night. Okay. So it wasn't like you were away a lot. You were home. Yeah. Well, I was just curious, you know, when you went to WWF, I'm sure, I don't know what, I, I've heard their schedule's pretty hectic. I don't know. You were on TV some. You probably did some house shows. Was that? Yeah, I was, we would do house shows. We would do them like a Tuesday. I don't know if they were Monday and Tuesday or Tuesday and Wednesday back then. We okay. did two days back to back. And then they would have me work some weekends when they were in Wisconsin or Illinois, okay. uh, South Dakota. But it, I mean, I, I was probably working once a month or month other than TV. Okay. Uh, but I got paid. I got paid real good money there for booking the guys for TV. Yeah. That's what I hear. I mean, they say that you get paid good for what you do there for... I mean, I know it's hard work and your body takes a pretty good beating at times, but they say they, they pays pretty good if you're in uh, the right spot. The top guys, the bottom guys don't make much. Yeah. They were making them like on a two days, they make 150 a night for two nights. Yeah. Which I guess back in that time period, that's probably like 900 today. Yeah. But while they were making that, I was making thousand fifteen hundred for two nights yeah because i was getting paid for everybody i brought okay yeah that's so out of those promotions uh which one did you prefer to work in do you think probably for burn okay i enjoyed bill watts bill and me got along good yeah uh, they treated me good there uh, Kansas City was fun, but the territory was down. It was, we weren't making any money. We were starving. Oh, wow. I mean, we drive to Wichita for 40 bucks on a Monday. And someone said, would you drive from Kansas City to Wichita? If you knew there was an envelope waiting there with 40 bucks in it. Nobody would have gone. <laughs> but we went and we got beat up on top of it. Yeah. Yeah. How was it like working for Vern and Wally? Were, were they pretty good as far as? They always treated me fine. Yeah. Uh, I've heard they've, they, you know, Vern paid well, everybody pretty good. And that, uh, you know, they treated people pretty good for the most part. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard that. For, I talked to Ken Patera and some other people that were there for a while. And, and yeah, they, Vern, Vern was fair. Uh, I mean, a lot of guys think they should have gotten more, but hey, that's, yeah. you want to get more, become the promoter, right? Right. <laughs> All right, so I did some research, uh, too, and uh, one of the events, you said you wrestled Brad Ringens, and I saw Super Sunday in 83, uh, you wrestled Brad, I believe, is that correct? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Well, I mean, that was probably... I, I, mean, I don't know what the Super Sunday was. It was in Minneapolis. It was yeah, in but 83. I'm just saying, I get a booking sheet. Okay. The show I go. Okay. I don't know what, I don't know what the... Okay, it was, a, it was a big crowd of about 20,000 people. May have been. And, I mean, what wrestling in that size of a crowd, is it... Do you get a little bit more of a... I don't know how to say it. A, a rush than you would for a crowd of maybe... 1500 or something or is no. it the same to you i think it's all the same all the same okay i think it's more who you're wrestling we had a big show in minneapolis one day and uh we had a closed circuit next door and mm -hmm. nick had, nick was in japan and flew in just just to wrestle and was flying back to japan and oh. i got to work with pat patterson okay that was a thrill i love pat great guy uh yeah and I remember two things to this uh, about that match to this day. Well, one thing was I would drove up with Jake, and uh, I had found out the day before that uh, 
a girl I had trained and who'd gone down to work with Mula uh, had broken her neck and oh. was paralyzed from the waist down. And I looked at Jake and says, I'm not taking no big bumps today. <laughs> and then I found out I was working with Pat, so I had to. But the first <laughs> thing Pat said to me, and I don't know how many people, I think most people know Pat was gay. Yeah. And Pat looked at me while the ref was giving instructions and he pointed at me and he said, kid, just remember, if I get behind you, you're fucked. <laughs> and then I was a baby face that match. And when I was making my comeback, he was on the mat begging and he's going, kiss me on the lips, Mary, kiss me on the lips. <laughs> uh, but it was a thrill to get to work with Pat in the house. Yeah, uh, yeah he had a big influence on... Uh wrestling on both sides uh you know when he went to wwf he was a big part of the the push they made and the uh, he was a his, very smart guy yeah yeah he was uh i know he passed about a year ago wasn't it or something like that yeah 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 so other uh do, do you remember any other big show did you work any other besides that one that you remember i mean pay-per-views i know like wrestlemania or no, I never worked. No, no, those. Okay. They Chemistry part time or any any of the real big shots. Yeah. Well, how about chemistry with anybody? Uh, who do you think when you wrestled them that you just or wrestled with as a tag team that you had that it factor that you guys just flowed well and and could put on a big show in the ring. I didn't have a problem with any of them. No. To be honest with you. I mean, the guy I wrestled probably more than anybody, and a lot of it was locally on our own shows, was Jake Milkman. Yeah. And we always had good matches. But I, I don't remember. I only had a problem with two guys. Yeah. One was Leon White, and that was in Vegas. Uh -huh. And he was just, this is when he was starting and he was clumsy and awkward. And I came out of the ring with my lip busted open. And I had to go into back. To, I had to switch dressing rooms on that show for the next hour. And I got into it with the dressing room. And if Jerry Blackwell hadn't got between us, I probably would have got my ass kicked. Because <laughs> uh, I didn't have anything good to say about Leon. Yeah. And then the next week, I had to work with him up in Wausau, Wisconsin. And the plane was late getting in, and I had to go 45 minutes with him. It was not pleasant. Yeah. And then I had a problem with the Road Warriors only because when they came in to work for Vern, I had called Greg and said, I'm not working with them. And they were not, Animal was not Animal, Hawk was not happy that I wouldn't work with them. What, what was it? You just didn't think they were ready or? And, no, when they were in Atlanta. They were told to beat the piss out of the job guys. Oh wow! I had a I had a I had to go to work on Monday. Yeah, I was not going to get hurt. Right. And the next time I worked with them was in WWF. When I saw that I was on the board against them, I went up and found Joe the Animal. Yeah. I said, Joe, you got your chance today. And he said, Shit, you were smart not to work with us back then. We didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. So, but those are the only two people I really had a problem with. Yeah. So with uh with Vader, uh the busted lip, was that the kind of what set you off? And, and then yeah, it was because I was trying to protect him because he didn't know what the hell he was doing. Yeah. And I ended up getting hurt over it. Okay. And I'm sorry, wrestling is a work. Yeah. You're supposed yeah. to take care of your opponent. Yeah. I was trained. Ray Stevens taught me. One of the first things he said is, "Your body is a fine piece of bone china. You're giving it to your opponent. You want it back in the same condition. You got it. Yeah, you gave it to him. Yeah, and so that was how I treated it. Yeah, and you could be light with someone if you wanted it, and you could be stiff with someone. Yeah." You know, Bret Hart was hard to work with, with the, as a job guy. Was he? Okay. He wouldn't give you anything, and he was stiff. Now, maybe he, and he was a guy I didn't know, so I can't, I'm not going to hold it against him. 
Right. And he was one of the worst guys I worked with. Okay, well, that's interesting. I've never heard that one. Not from I've heard about the Road Warriors that when they first yeah, he almost broke my neck. Oh, okay. He gave me a pile driver, and you only get a guy if you want to get him. Yeah. And for whatever reason, he got me, and my neck was ringing. I thought he broke my neck. Wow. So I I don't have much respect for Bret Hart. Okay. I've heard about the road warriors. They were really stiff when they first, especially when they, yeah, they were out. real easy when they were in uh, New York. Yeah, that's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, let's talk about some guys that you trained. You uh, mentioned the Texas hangman. Well, actually uh, there's three Texas hangmen. I trained all three of them. Okay. One became bull pain. Uh, Rick Gantner. Uh, and then there's Mike Moran, who became, he was like the leader of the group. He was always one of the hangmen. And then sure. uh, Tom Bennett uh, was the third hangman. And there was a fourth and a fifth, too, but they're local guys. So Okay. So are you, uh, now are you, are you part of the business still? Or are you doing uh, local I have, promotions? I have not been part of the business since about 1994. Okay. When my kid became old enough to play baseball, I kind of quit wrestling and went to all his baseball games and coached. And Wow, that's good. And I've kind of worked once every 10 years since then just to work. Okay. I'm still trying to get, still trying to get one more match so I can say I worked in six decades, but it doesn't look like it's never going to happen. You come down here to Missouri, uh, there's a Mid-States Wrestling promotion. I'm sure... They do it. They're they're out of uh, Harrison, Arkansas, and Springfield, Missouri. There, I've seen some guys there that. No, I, I drive about twenty minutes to do it. That's okay. My, <laughs> well, okay, that's yeah. my limit. A that's couple of years ago, I was going to go work for Buck Zumhoff before he ended up getting put in prison. Yeah. But when I thought about it, it was such a long drive. Yeah. And he was the one to pay me, but by the time I paid for a hotel and yeah. the gasoline. I mean, it would have made six dollars. It wasn't it. Yeah. Uh, Crusher Fest. I was at Crusher Fest. I was. I didn't know you were from Milwaukee. I I was surprised that you weren't a part of that. Is there? I mean, I've been totally away from the business. Yeah, I know, but because I just and yeah, I heard about it. Yeah. But again, I, I'm not a mark. And I really didn't have any. Okay. I understand. I, know, I just I was. Know, I know Greg and Jim. I guess Greg and Jim were there. Yeah, I was. But uh, I just stay away. Okay. I mean, I, I guess my other way of looking at it is when I was full time, I'd go out drinking with the guys and do whatever the guys were doing. Yeah. But when I became part time, I was in a different, I saw it as being different. Yeah. And I didn't want to intrude in their thing. Okay. So, well, I mean, they had uh, Kenny J was there, uh, Medusa, uh, Greg and Jim, and uh, Bischoff. They were all there. Uh, so I was kind of surprised when I heard, especially when I hear you live in Milwaukee, that they at least didn't reach out and say, hey, Come someone, on. May, someone may have. Yeah. But I don't remember. Okay. Oh, that's, I would have loved to have met you in person. I mean, that would have been pretty cool to meet you in, in, in person uh, instead of virtual, but that's okay. I mean, I'll take anything I can get, you know? So, <laughs> all right. Well, do you watch wrestling now? Once in a great while. Okay. And, you're, and what's your opinion of it versus... Well, number one, I don't know why they do it anymore. Okay. Because there's no crowd reaction. I mean, the fans, and this started with ECW, mm -hmm. they chant the name of the promotion. There are no heels and baby faces anymore. Yeah. I mean, you can say there is, but if everybody knows it's a work, Yeah. I don't... I don't you have to work too hard. Because they cheer the bump. 
they cheer. That's why guys have to, they've got to go through three tables now and four tables. Now it's flaming tables. Yeah. I heard Cody Rhodes just did that through a flaming table. I mean, it's no <laughs> longer, it used to be they liked Buck, they hated me. Yeah. And we'd go out and we'd work that. That was what we were working. Yeah. If I could get eight minutes wearing flowered trunks and trying to take off my warm ups and getting the people with buck clapping and getting not have to tie up or anything, yeah. that's what you would do. Yeah. Yeah. Now you have to take the next biggest bump and nobody sells them. So none of the bumps mean anything. Yeah. Right. They take a double, triple somersault off the top rope on top of each other and then they get up and the other guy does it to the, it's not wrestling. Yeah. I don't know why you'd want to do it. Yeah. The do fun, you, the fun was getting the crowd yeah. to do what you wanted them to do. That was the fun of it. Yeah. I don't see the fun of it anymore. Yeah. Do you think a uh, part of that is uh social media, the internet? Because yeah, it, I mean they know. I yeah. mean, when Vince came out and said it's all work, it's all play acting. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh that kind of I mean, at least when we were wrestling, 20% were diehards. They believed it was all real. Yeah. 20% knew it wasn't. They were there for the fun of it. Yeah. The other 60% would go to work on Monday and go, I know it's all fake. But when they were there, yeah, they, they weren't sure. Yeah. I can tell you from my perspective, you know, I, you know, grew up in the 80s. You know, I was born in the 70s. Uh, I could not, I, I believed that Nick Bockwinkle was such a crude and awful person. Cheater, Ray Stevens, same thing, you know, most of his career, he was a, you know, a heel. And I truly believed it. You know, I was like, that guy is, but, and then you had your baby faces, you know, your Hogan's, your uh santana's your martell's those guys they would come to the rescue you know and 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 now it's more of yeah we wrestle in the ring for 15 20 minutes whatever it doesn't even go that long anymore for most matches and then they're on social media uh high-fiving each other and it's just kind of a lost art i think uh I don't know if you ever heard of a guy by the name of Mac Davis. He's uh, a commentator, does a small promotion. He says it's just an exhibition now. It's not a. It's not the art of it. It's not the work. It's all exhibition. Right. I was at a local show, and the guy in the first. There was a guy in the first match. In fact, he was wrestling a woman in the first match. Okay. He, he was going to do the job. Yeah. Five minutes before, he's wandering in the crowd. Yeah. Well, you'd never see Willie Nelson in the crowd before the show. He might sign autographs after the show. But he, he if you're a star, you're not out there. Before. I would have fired the guy on the spot. <laughs> he's lucky he wasn't working for me. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, it's so different now. Yeah. And more power to them. I mean, they're great athletes. Yeah. But... I mean, you got the one guy in AEW, I'm not sure of his name, but he keeps his hands in his pockets. Oh, yeah, that's uh, Orange Cassidy. Okay. Yeah. I wish he would have done that to Harley Race. You know what's funny is two weeks ago, maybe a week ago, I just did a podcast with his son, Leland. Yeah, and we were talking about some stuff about that, and yeah. Absolutely. Harley Race probably would have put him on his hind end and put him out the door. Oh, he would have, he would have never wrestled again. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there were a lot of guys who would have done that. Yeah. Because you protected the business. That's not, that's just being a clown. Yeah. That's a shit that wounds it for everybody now. Yeah. You know, I've been to some of the smaller promotions around here. I, I live uh, in Missouri, southern Missouri. And I really think that those local promotions, I think they're going to start making a comeback. I just feel like people are getting kind of tired of the, the schematics, the, the gimmicks, the lack of 
What do you think about that? I don't think it'll ever come back. You don't think so? Every day there's less and less. People don't want to go to live events. People want to sit on their phone. That's true. You're not invested in the in the wrestlers. Why would you spend fifteen dollars if you don't want to see Jerry Lawler kick the shit out of some heel? Yeah. Why would you spend fifteen dollars to see if someone gets hurt? Yeah. I just. That's why the ratings on TV yeah. back in the eighties. <laughs> if you took all the TVs that were on all over the country. Mm -hmm. All those local ones, they were drawing millions of people every week. Yeah. Millions and 20 million people. Yeah. I mean, we were drawing, Vern was probably getting a million watchers in Milwaukee on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. Now on cable, Vince gets 400,000 viewers. They're all gone. Yeah. And once you lose a fan, they're never coming back. Yeah. Now, do you think, like, that's part of my, thing is that I believe because it's not really how do you say what 70s 8 when you wrestled in the 70s 80s and into the early 90s it was everybody I mean not everybody a lot of people knew it was okay but it wasn't out and it was well, they, still they thought it might be right but it was still the, the guys Nick when Nick and Billy were working they knew that was real. Right. Even if they thought, even if they were saying it was fake all week. Yeah. They knew when Nick and Billy were working, it was real. Right. But I'm saying if they maybe went back to that concept. The cat's out of the bag. It's out of the bag. But what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is make it more believable. Yeah. Everybody knows it's a word. It's it a, a hold anymore because the fans boo it. Yeah, I guess. I guess you're right. I I would believe it if it came back and I actually saw a real heat. Everything has to be running off the ropes and coming off the top rope and diving to the floor. And eventually, yeah. it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know, back in the day, each guy had a finish move and they would, they would do the same finish move for years and years yeah. and years. Yeah. And it was theirs. Got your sleeper. The figure four leg lock for Ric Flair. Right. The Singapore sleeper, the pile driver for Bachwinkle. But um, now you can't beat anyone with any of those. Yeah. So I, I think the cat's out of the bag. It's never going to come back. Well, I hope you're wrong because I want to see it come back. I would really enjoy it. I don't watch it as much as I used to either. And actually, I just go actually to YouTube a lot and watch the old ones or because like you said, it's, you know, it's not the, there's not a lot of heat. There's not that I want to punch. They don't punch care. Right. It's like if you, have a, you live near St. Louis. I'm a few hours from St. Louis. I'm closer to Springfield, Missouri, but yeah, I'm a few hours from St. Louis. Okay, so you're near near enough, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The St. Louis Cardinals are playing baseball. Mm -hmm. Fans in St. Louis want to cheer, right? Yeah. But if you brought in and the game you brought into St. Louis was Milwaukee against Atlanta, you might go because it was a major league game. Yeah. There's no, no investment. Yeah. True. You know, I live here in Wisconsin. If I go to the Packer game. I'm invested in the Packer game. Yeah. But if you have the Baltimore Ravens play the Pittsburgh Steelers in Lambeau, who the hell cares? Right. And there are no strong personalities anymore. Yeah. Because even the interviews are pre-written for you. Yeah. So you have no, there's, it's not coming from the heart. Yeah. You're not the first person that said that to me that's been on this podcast. Um, that's another big problem is everything is pre-scripted, pre right. predetermined. Now I know in your era, you had a finishing, you had the finish. We knew the finish usually. Right, usually. But from time the bell rang until whatever time period for the finishing, it was all between you and the individual you were working with. Correct. 
And now, now they pre, and when we were doing it, the whole theory and what I was taught mm -hmm. was to find out what the people want. And yeah. So if I took you to the ropes and I hit you and got no reaction, mm -hmm. I would then have you take me to the ropes and hit me. See, if we had a, that didn't work either. Okay, then yeah, now yeah. we'll do a one-two. I'll hit you and you hit me. We keep trying something until we've got the people popping to react. Yeah. Now they go through to the dressing room and they have, okay, now I'm going to add one minute, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this. And then I was at a local show a while back and a guy started clapping and the fans started clapping with him. Well, he quit because it was time to do their next move. <laughs> and I'm going, why would you do that? The whole reason you're out there is to get the crowd with you. Yeah. And you had just accomplished that and then you took it away from them. So I'm sorry, I don't get it. <laughs> no, I, I'm with you. You know, I don't, I, the, I don't get the fun of scripting your match. In fact, the kids today couldn't do what we used to do. Yeah. We worked in Shreveport on Friday night in Louisiana for Watts. My mm -hmm. first idea. I was working with Jerry Oates. I know to Jerry Oates. To this day, I've never met him. Really? We were our, we, he dressed on the north end of the building. I dressed on the south end. Of the oh, he's a great guy. Great guy. Yeah, but we went to the ring. We had never talked. We had never seen each other. I knew what the finish was. He didn't. Okay. In the room with Roby. And uh, I just led the match. Walked him through the match, walked him into the finish, did the finish. And we walked away, never said another word to him. He left the territory. That was his last night in the territory. Wow. Okay. And to show you how it was back then, that was my first night. I had driven down from Kansas City. And I was told that night by Jake Roberts, I stayed at Jake's house that night. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, they were going to fire you tonight. Well, during my match, Watts, Robley, and Grizzly Smith were all watching. And had I had a bad match, they were going to fire me on the spot. Wow. For, for what? Just because? Because they didn't want me. And then after that, they decided I did a good enough job seeing I was leading and we had a good match and everything was good. And a couple of weeks later, they started. The, the underneath guys for Bill were only working two or three or four nights a week, they weren't, they weren't making a whole lot of money. And globally put me down on the sheet. I was every Monday I refereed in, uh, in New Orleans, which was the big paying town. Okay. And when I went up to him and I said, you know, I really don't want a referee. He says, I'm trying to get you six nights of work a week or six nights work every week. Okay. So you're making money. You're making yeah. twice what all the other guys are making. And Watts said, you can all, you always have a job with me if you want. It. Oh, that's nice. So I had a good first match, but that could have been a terrible first match. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. I been packing my bag and going back to Milwaukee. So it was not an easy business. No. No, I mean, uh, I spoke to Leland race harley's son a few weeks back and he says when he gets students in because he has a training academy up in uh by st louis there they they think once they're out of the academy they're going to be a superstar that's their mindset when they walk into that building that's all of our mindsets but that's what you think when i got when i started working locally i was the big star right when i started working going on the road i wanted to be a big star yeah but I realized unless someone was going to let me manage, I didn't have the physique to be a big star. Yeah. And then when I came back to Milwaukee and I got a job at the electric company with benefits and pension and profit sharing, I decided part-time was fine. Yeah. What I mean is, uh, maybe I should elaborate more, that they thought once they were out of the academy there, uh, they'd be in the, you know, a main, a super... Uh, like a WrestleMania the following year or something like that as a, there are exceptions, I guess, but I don't think very few are going to go from a Academy 
training to WrestleMania. I mean, it might have... the academy that's not connected with. Right. I mean, but Vince the... has his own. Has his own, yeah. Bring their own guys. Yeah. You've got to pay a lot of dues. Yeah. Not, you can't do it, but right. you've got to pay a lot of dues. Yeah. I think that's kind of the lost art, too, is that, you know, there's no going, you know, I've heard from other guys, You went, there were 26 territories at one time around the country in the 70s and into the 80s. And then uh, when WWF started, went national, it slowly crumbled down to, you know, what is there now? Probably big ones. There's what WWE, AEW, and Impact. That's the three I know. Ring of Honor. It's the Ring of Honor, which is going out of business from what I understand at the end of the year. So do you think that's part of the problem is that they're not getting their... Part of the problem is there's no fresh spaces. You know, in the day, you could work in Kansas City and then go down and work for Watts and then you go work for Eddie Graham and then come up and work for Nick Goulas or, uh, you know, Waller. I mean, yeah. you go out to Portland, you can go to L.A., you go to Calgary. Well, if you spent six months in each of those territories learning, when you went back to Kansas City, now you were ready to be a star. Yeah. And you could go and do a job in Calgary and nobody in Kansas City knew you were doing jobs in Calgary. Yeah. Once it became national, once you did a job nationally, everybody knew you were a loser. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's hard to take a guy who's not a star and make him a star, but you could do that. You know, I could have been working for Watts and go on to Portland and become a manager. Yeah. And I know Bobby Heenan type of manager. Right. And I could have become a big star. And by the time I went down and worked for Watts again, they had forgotten about me because I was only there for eight months. Yeah. And, you know, I got beaten each town twice in over eight. Yeah. Now, how do you do that? Where do you learn? Yeah. No, back, in my day, back in my day, you learn because you would ride up and down the roads mm -hmm. with, I used to ride with Stephen Little Bear a lot in Louisiana and we would talk wrestling theory and he would teach me. Yeah. That's where you learned. Yeah. Uh, I hear the kids today, even on their road trips, all they do is look at their phone. Yeah. I'm that's, sorry, that's not how you learn this business. You don't learn it in the five minutes you're in the ring. Yeah. You learn it in the three hours that you drive to get somewhere and the yeah. three hours that you come back. Yeah. No, I I agree. I think it uh a lot of it is a is a lost art. And I'm really hoping, you know, that and you you don't think it will, but I'm really hoping it will come back. You know how how long the bear, the bears have been hoping they could get a quarterback? That ain't never happening either. Well, like you, I'm a Packers guy because I'm from Wisconsin. So I am a Green Bay guy. I was a Green Bay guy when they were awful in the 80s and into the early 90s. So they got I, I don't think kids today have the, the kind of fun we had either. I'm going to tell you a junkyard dog story. because Please do. We were, uh, we used to travel together quite a bit in Louisiana when I wasn't with Stephen Little Bear. Uh, they called us salt and pepper for a while. <laughs> One night we had finished wrestling somewhere in Mississippi and dog pulled into a 7-Eleven and I think we were in Chula, Mississippi. And he said, go get us some beers and get yourself a soda and here's some money. So I went in and uh, well, I didn't know at the time we were in a part of Chula, Mississippi mm -hmm. that no one with my pale skill, skin color would ever go to. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'm at the corner picking out, I'm at this soda rack picking out my sodas, and I turned around and I'm surrounded by five big black guys. Oh, boy. Well, Dog knew what he was doing. Yeah. He came waltzing in just about that time. Uh, Should have came a little quicker because my pants <laughs> boiled. Uh, <laughs> put his arm around me, and then everything was cool. But he did that just... To mess with me 
Give you a little rib, huh? <laughs> uh, and I don't think the kids today have any of that fun. I mean, I, I really don't. No, it's today. It's everybody's so sensitive and it's crazy. You know, I, yeah, I can't even, I try to stay off social media. I'll be honest with you, Tom, when I'm only time I'm on is when I do this stuff because I enjoy speaking to wrestlers like yourself or promoters and, and I put it on there and I get feedback. Uh, but other than that, I'm kind of in a cocoon here at my house. I don't like you. I, I just, yeah, my mouth sometimes the filter is from back in the eighties and nineties still. And if you say something today, you know, that people consider inappropriate or you know uh, that wasn't inappropriate back then it, it you you know you're a well, target well we used every racial slur in the book and the guy you're wrestling didn't care yeah well they didn't but uh, i mean they, back in the 80s you got to think about it colonel de beers you remember him with jimmy snuka you think that would fly today that would be banned the guys would be tarred and feathered and never heard from again because of what they did 30 years ago. People need to get a life. Right. And that's like another thing with wrestling. It's all now kind of cookie cutter. They don't, they don't really get that heat like we were talking about earlier because if you offend a certain group or something, they're going to blast you on social media or something. And, and they're gonna and they're gonna bury you and that's the problem too i think is they don't want to get that heat because of social media i'm afraid they're gonna get in trouble or you know it, it it's it's crazy it's crazy world now and anyway i got off track there i apologize let's oh that's okay <laughs> it's not like you're on the same side as i am i am yeah Let's talk about your book real quick here. Sure. Let's talk about it. The Theater of the Absurd. The professional wrestling. I never wanted to be a big star. What is it about? Obviously, it's about wrestling, but I mean, let's get into it a little bit. It's road stories. Oh, good. You've got very little in the ring stuff. Okay. You know, there's stuff about my match with Brody and mm -hmm. Diamond and that and there's a match about me and Kim, Kim Patera there. But okay. usually road stories like Junkyard Dog. Yeah. Or the night the Freebirds had Buddy Roberts' bag with them and they picked up Roadkill and put it in the bag and then let it sit in the Louisiana sun the next day. Oh. 24 hours. <laughs> and got to New Orleans on Monday night and Buddy put the gear on oh. and we're all passing out in the dressing room. And as he just put it on and went to the ring. And people are passing out in the streets. That's the kind of stuff that's in the book. It or, sounds like a great New book. Orleans, in, in New Orleans, we always worked in one quarter of the ring. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time on the mat in one quarter of the ring. Okay. There was a girl in the front row who wore no panties. <laughs> so we all, everything that happened in the ring there was in front of her. You know, so there's stories... There's a couple of good free bird stories. And yeah. in Kansas City one night, we're coming back from Des Moines, and I was with Bob Brown and Bob Geigel, and they told me to pull into the median strip. They yeah. pulled shotguns or rifles out of the car, and they were out in the median trying to shoot cats. Oh. They said they were feral cats and they were they'd kill the bird, they'd eat the bird's eggs. So they're at two in the morning, they're walking up and down with shot. I thought I was going to prison yeah you know so uh that's great so there's stories about the awa my days there in kansas city and louisiana yeah. and there's probably some road stories about new york uh, it's just really road stories i don't think there's that much to tell about the, the matches you know yeah. no that's great i saw it the other day so if you're listening or watching pick up tom's book it's on uh, amazon we'll have the description below and, you know, go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I was going to say, I wrote the book because Hangman Mike uh, asked, told me I should write it. Yeah. 
And it's really all the road stories that we told each other in the car mm -hmm. and that we've been telling for the last 30 years Yeah, to keep them when I'm gone, the road stories will still be there. Yeah. I wish more books like that from the wrestlers were out. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about books like yours and, and some stories and, and things like that. I don't think there's enough of that. And I read in your uh, foreword, uh, you talked about you wouldn't have wrote this book because you kept wanting to keep the, the business. Yeah, I protected the business for years. I yep. never wanted to say, but seeing it's out there, yeah, I guess yeah. it doesn't pay. But even when I was losing and you'd go to, you'd go to work on, you know, yeah. one day, boy, you lost. Yeah, well, they're better than me, right? <laughs> and you could legally actually say that because Brad Riggins, Olympic athlete. Yeah. Saido, Olympic athlete. Yeah. And the story about Saida and Patera is in there because I was with them the night that they ended up. Oh, all right. That's in this book. Anyways, uh, <laughs> but Olympic athlete, Vern Gagne, Olympic athlete. Yeah. Uh, Billy Robinson not only was Olympic athlete, but he was an he athlete. Could, there's a great Billy Robinson story in the book, too. Okay. Let's pick it up, folks. I'll just say I walked up to him on the way to the ring. And I was wrestling him in Rockford. And I said, Billy, he was a heel at the time. I said, how come when you were a baby face, you were such a prick? And I turned and went to the ring. I had no idea what would happen. Jake even looked at me. He was with me. He said, why did you do that? I said, let's see what happens. <laughs> Guess who looked like Billy Robinson that night? <laughs> Tom Stone. Tom Stone. All thanks to Billy Robinson. Billy Robinson made me look like I was a world mm. champion. That's great. That's great. All right. Well, I think I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Folks, if you're listening or watching, Rocky, Tom Rocky Stone, pick up his book. We'll have it down in the description. Thank you so much, sir, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Happy holidays to you and your family. You too. After you get a chance to read the book, if you want to talk again, give me a call. I will. I will definitely. I'm going to read the book. Like I said, full disclosure, folks, I just found out about this book the other day, so I didn't have time to read it. And having Tom on here uh, was a pleasure, and we're going to get back with him on it, definitely. So thanks again, Tom Rocky Stone, for coming on. Appreciate it. Happy holidays to you, and happy holidays to all the people out there. We'll talk to you soon.